I'd like to begin this evening with an invocation. It is our tradition here at Odd Salon that we begin with somebody else's words to inspire and set the tone for the evening. And so I have a sort of modest proposal of sorts, and here it is, and that is, orchids are bullshit. So hear me out. Do we all know who this handsome guy is? How about now? Okay, so Charles Darwin, possibly one of the most famous scientists in history, one of the few recognizable by face after almost a century. He was exceptionally brilliant. He had wide-ranging interest and expertise. He was a loving father with a, a loving father and husband. He had 10 children. Um, he was a prolific and enthusiastic letter writer his entire life, and he felt compelled to answer every letter that crossed his desk, including even the ones, as one reviewer put it, were sent to him by obvious fools or cranks. <laughs> so he, along with Alfred Russel Wallace and their generation of enthusiastic species seekers, re revolutionized what we know about human origins and the evolutionary adaptations of nature. But sometimes, often even, he had very bad days. In October of 1861, he wrote this letter. Uh, the conversation opens with some friendly chit-chat about geology, but then when it gets to the end, it ends like this. And I can translate that Victorian handwriting for you. He says, but I am very poorly today and very stupid and I hate everybody and everything. <laughs> So what brought this great man so low? What was the source of this existential misery? And the answer, I feel like you might know, is fucking orchids. <laughs> the full excerpt of the letter reads, but I am very poorly today and very stupid and hate everybody and everything. One lives only to make blunders. I am gonna write a little book for Murray on orchids and today I hate them worse than anything. <laughs> So farewell, and in a sweet frame of mind, I am ever yours, C. Darwin. <laughs> this wonderful letter was written to his colleague, the Scottish geologist Charles Lyell, about a year after the publication of Origin of the Species. Lyell's work had influenced Darwin as a young man. He had brought uh, Lyell's uh, Scottish geography book with him on the voyage of the Beagle. Slow, slow. <laughs> Later, Lyell was in turn influenced by Darwin after Origin of the Species was, was released, and he changed his mind about the ancient origins of mankind and discarded his earlier biblical, biblically influenced mindset. So they had this really great synergy and there were frequent correspondence. Um, I could have chosen a stodgy black and white portrait of Charles Lyell, but I chose this cartoon instead because I couldn't resist. Uh, because like most scientists, he also, he got a lot of things right, but he also got a lot of things wrong. And when he was considering the future of geologic time, he also pondered climate change and what would happen to this world in the future, um, sort of on a geologic time scale. And he posited that with a warming earth, there might be a return of pterodactyls and other dinosaurs. So this, uh, this cartoon shows future dinosaurs uh, pondering their ancient origins of the humans that might have come before them with a skull underneath the rock. It's kind of great. So anyhow, <laughs> by the time Darwin had this crabby day, he'd been obsessing over orchids for more than 20 years. He'd become fascinated by them on walks near his home um, into a nearby valley that was abundant with British orchids. I did not actually know there were such a thing as British orchids, but it turns out there's rather a lot of British orchids. Um, and he was really keen to understand the relationship between the plants and the insects that pollinated him. And he was working on this subject even as, and perhaps to distract him from publishing Origin of the Species, which took him, I think, 17 years to complete before he was finally sort of pushed into publication by another one of his friends and colleagues uh, because of the publications of Alfred Russell Wallace and he wanted to, to beat him to the punch. They actually ended up publishing simultaneously in another sort of great moment in science history. So this is the book, it's called The Fertilization of Orchid Orchids, also known as The Various Contrivances by Which British and Foreign Orchids Are Fertilized by Insects and on the Good Effects of Intercrossing. <laughs> it was successfully published at long last in 1862. I don't want to shock anyone, but there are some pretty graphic illustrations of orchid sexy bits in this book. I mean, right? Um, in particular, 
Darwin was obsessed with the bee orchid, which exhibits particularly extraordinary mimicry of the insect that once pollinated it. And he, like with his finches and their beaks, he contemplated the unique adaptations and synergy between the plants and the pollinators and began to explore the unique structures of the proboscis of various moths and how they were uniquely suited to the plant partners that they pollinated. And he came across this one orchid. He extrapolated on data that he found and theorized about a possible moth, uh, an imaginary moth that might be able to pollinate this one, the Madagascar Christmas orchid, now known as the Darwin orchid, um, which is notable for its extremely long spur. You can see it in the illustration here, that bit that hangs off, that's the part that needs to get pollinated. So it would require an as yet undiscovered creature with an exceptional 12 inch proboscis. So, I told you, I know. Um, so, after the publication of this book, some other naturalists look at his theory about this unknown creature, and they looked at it with scorn and suggested that Darwin's imagination was getting the best of him, making up imaginary animals that have to exist to fit the plant. But in 1867, Wallace backed him up with further theorization about this as yet still undiscovered, but certainly very reasonable and fits nicely with our theories, moth. And he published this illustration of the hypothetical beastie, which he titled in a pamphlet that he titled Creation by Law. But lo and behold, for decades, Darwin's hypothetical moth remained elusive, but then Darwin's hawk moth, as it's now known, it's a type of uh, xanthopan sphinx, sphinx moth. Um, they occur on mainland Africa, but it was finally confirmed in Madagascar in 1903. This, <laughs> this specimen is in the collection of the California Academy of Sciences, and it was collected in 1998 in an expedition to Madagascar. And for scale, you can see this extraordinary moth doing his work. So Darwin didn't live to see his moth theories vindicated, but the discovery and confirmation of his ability to correctly interpret the data available to him and hypothesize the missing link goes down as one of the great accomplishments in evolutionary science. So I want to go back to that letter because I fucking love it. I would like this embroidered on a festive sampler in my home. <laughs> To me, it is one of the great delights of studying history to find these hidden moments and to feel a kinship, to think, oh man, I know what that day is like. I also sometimes hate everybody and everything. <laughs> Darwin, like everyone, wasn't just one thing. He was a dude with anxiety and doubt. He was constantly worried about his research. He was worried about his health to the point of almost being a hypochondriac. He was worried about the opinions of others, both colleagues and friends, and he had crappy days. And Darwin's hatred of orchids has become kind of a shorthand in my own life <laughs> to find context on my crappy days that sometimes hidden in our biggest frustrations may also be the seeds of our greatest accomplishments. And so I take pleasure in this quote, not just because Darwin had a crappy day, but also because I feel lucky, like Darwin, in the company that I get to keep. Ultimately, it was Darwin's community that helped him keep his shit together. It, so he, they supported him so that he could push through, do the work, see the orchids, and imagine the moth. So tonight, as we celebrate our fifth year together, doing this ridiculous and wonderful thing together, I want to invite you to raise a glass with me, the first glass of the last night of 2018, and I want to raise my glass to you to our marvelous and inspiring community, to our fellows, our speakers, to our mob of volunteers tonight, and to our new and growing membership, to all of you here on this anniversary night. So I want to raise my glass to you. Cheers.